Good afternoon and welcome to the Epilepsy Foundation of Connecticut webinar. This is a three-part series, has been a three-part series on transition and is provided by the Yukon Center for Excellence in Developmental Disabilities. My name is Monica Anzalone and I will be moderating uh, today's webinar. For the purposes of sound quality, everyone has been put in listen-only mode but we welcome you to use the chat icon that's located, should be located on the bottom of your screen where you can type all of your questions and those will be answered at the end of the presentation today. This is the final webinar in the transition series that we've had this month. And today's webinar is titled Transitioning from Pediatrics to Adult Healthcare. And I know that this is a significant topic for all of the families that we work here at the Epilepsy Foundation. I would like to introduce now then the presenter for the webinar today, Dr. Craig Schramm. Dr. Schramm is currently the Division Head of Pulmonary Medicine, the Medical Director of Respiratory Therapy at the Connecticut Children's Medical Center, and is also an Associate Professor of Pediatrics at the University of Connecticut School of Medicine. Um, at the UConn USED, he serves at, at the, um, as a specialty resource contact and is also the health discipline coordinator. Among other topics, he is an expert on transitioning from pediatric to adult care for adolescents and young adults with a full range of disabilities. So we welcome Dr. Schramm as our presenter today. Thank you very much. And uh, thank all of you who have, uh, are joining in. Um, as Monica said, I am not a neurologist, and so you're asking, what does Dr. Schramm know about epilepsy? And I will confess that I don't know a lot, other than that I do care for many, many children with epilepsy who have associated breathing issues, uh, either with seizures or with other disabilities. And one of our longstanding challenges has been how do we best transition older complex patients from pediatric to adult medicine. And this is a topic I've been interested in for the last 10 years or so, and, and uh, was invited to join the, the UConn USED in that capacity to uh, assist in both uh, patient and provider training in healthcare transition, and uh, perhaps doing a little bit of research on this as well. So, uh, I can make my first slide go. Okay. I'm experiencing technical difficulties here. If you excuse me one second. Okay, we're gonna to have to get some help on this end. So uh, let's talk a little bit about transition versus transfer. So, uh, and what we'd like to do today is talk some about transition, talk um, about the different challenges that um, both uh, we as providers and, and you as patients face in transition, and uh, try to identify some strategies that can improve the healthcare transition process. So uh, as a first, um, uh, first introduction to this, let's just explain the difference between transfer and transition. So transfer is an event. Um, someone is in the hospital, they get transferred to a rehab facility or someone is going to one doctor and then just transfers their care to uh, another doctor. As compared to transition, which is a process, and I'm gonna have someone here try to fix my slides. All right, thank you. All right, now we're going. So, uh, whereas transition is a process that provides really a coordinated and un un 
uninterrupted transfer of care. So it's not leaping from uh, across a precipice from one cliff to another. It's a bridge from pediatric to adult care. It's a complex process in which the individual gradually moves from a child being cared for to hopefully an independent, autonomous young adult with his or her own responsibilities for health care. The goal is to help children become adults who are as independent as possible and in this population who have the best seizure control as possible. So the scope of the problem, epilepsy, as you all know, is the most common childhood onset neurological disorder uh, that continues into adolescence. It affects 15 million children globally. It's a disorder often characterized not only by seizures, but by behavioral, social, physical, and intellectual disabilities and challenges as well. Seizures can remit or resolve in about 50% of patients during childhood, but persist into adulthood in the other half of the patients. And so uh, there becomes a need at some point to consider adult health care for our patients with, with epilepsy. Over 15 years ago now, all four of the major uh, U.S. health groups, the American Academy of Pediatrics, the Academy of Family Physicians, and two internal medicine groups, the College of Physicians and Society of Internal Medicine, came up with a consensus statement on health care transitions for young adults with special health care needs. And this was based on Two, two recognitions. One, that children receive optimal primary care in a medical practice experienced in the care of children. But then the flip side of that coin is that adults benefit from receiving care from physicians who are trained and experienced in adult care. And so a well-timed transition from child-oriented to adult-oriented health care allows young people to optimize their ability to assume adult roles and functions. There are several barriers to transitioning though, so in many ways it's easier said than done. And like the Great Wall of China here, uh, several uh, barriers can impede our progress in this. And the barriers can come from us pediatric providers, can come from adult providers, and can also be present in patients and families. So we as pediatricians have long-standing relationships with our patients and families. They're, they're families that I've known for over 20 years that I've seen on a, on a regular basis. We may believe that our knowledge or skills are better or are preferable to the care of the chronic condition, regardless of the patient's age. We may be, and I'll tell you, we are familiar with community resources and they lack the time and knowledge to effectively coordinate the transition process. And uh, for me, patients and families may have more contact with subspecialists than their primary care providers. You know, so for my complex patients, I see them at least probably three or four times a year, and they may only be going to their primary care provider once a year or less. And these families may not just see me, of course, they're seeing their neurologist, they may be seeing their orthopedic surgeon, they may be seeing their gastroenterologist, a whole host of subspecialists uh, that, we, that we try to coordinate our care with. So uh, several years ago now, it's from 2008, the American Academy of Pediatrics did a survey of, of pediatricians in this country, looked at uh, these, the responses from 628 of, uh, of pediatricians who provided care to patients over 12 years of age. And they asked about barriers. What barriers did the pediatricians perceive in uh, transferring care from themselves to uh, adult providers? And uh, this graph shows some of the most common perceived barriers in the pediatric practices, blue bars 
say that for most of the time they encountered this difficulty and the uh, reddish bars indicated that some of the time they they encountered this these problems and you can see that for many of them almost half the time 40 percent or so of the time most of the most transitions encountered these problems and up to 80 percent of the time at least sometimes they encountered these problems and these problems can included either lack of primary care providers or uh, specialists on the adult side or related to that lack of knowledge or links to adult community services from the, the pediat pediatricians. Uh, there were problems with insurance reimbursement for healthcare transition, insufficient time to really provide the transition services, and lack of staff skills to assist the provider in that transition planning. But then also more of the, the social issues, uh, difficulty in breaking bonds with the patients and families, and lack of the adolescent's knowledge or skills to, to self-advocate. Adult providers have barriers too in this transition. Uh, they, in, PD, in epilepsy uh, specifically, many pediatric onset epilepsy syndromes have different treatments and different adult outcomes with various cognitive or other comorbid, comorbidities. And these can be very different than the sort of typical adult with focal epilepsy, focal epilepsy of temporal lobe origin. So adult neurologists, adult epilepsy uh, uh, physicians are very comfortable caring for the usual adult onset epilepsy, but may have had little training in childhood epilepsy, uh, particularly in the epilepsies that are associated with various uh, genetic defects. And that, so then they can be intimidated by the complexity of pediatric epilepsies as compared to the adults. Capitated reimbursement systems serve as a incentive. So if you just get X number of dollars per visit, a visit that takes a lot of time is a disincentive. And they may lack support from the adult hospital or other subspecialists. So our neurologists contact me if they have, uh, if a patient has breathing issues, they may contact uh, uh, GI specialists for feeding issues, and we're all housed in the same hospital, and so it's relatively easy to speak to each other and communicate. That may become more difficult out in the adult world. Patients and families, too, uh, perceive problems with transition. Uh, families are very familiar with me, are comfortable with the care that I provide. And there are different practice styles between pediatric and adult health care providers. Uh, people have said that we in pediatrics are a little bit more family focused, uh, pay a little bit more attention to the global condition of the patient, and maybe try to incorporate, certainly incorporate the family more into the patient's care, uh, whereas adult providers are really focused much more on the patient, less on the family, sometimes are more focused on the disease process itself rather than on the global condition of the patient. And so it's just a, a different approach, not saying as one is necessarily better or worse, and in fact, as people get older, um, several surveys have shown that older youth appreciate the responsibility for their own care and the efficiency that the adult healthcare system provides as compared to the pediatric system that they had, had just left. So this is a complicated slide it, entitled The Journey of Advocacy, and it, it was um, proposed by a person named Rebecca Schultz, who is the pediatric nurse practitioner in the Comprehensive Epilepsy Program at Texas Children's Hospital. And she sees 
transition from pediatric health care in the top left corner to adult health care on the mid right as going through a series of eddies or turmoils um, related to the to the process and it sees this in terms of five temporally sequenced but interactive categories. First, the crisis that sparks transition, then parents in turmoil, parents as advocates, a web of information, and captive waiting. And each category contains several concepts. And so the, the theory is that some crisis precipitates this change. And Typically, the underlying factor that sparks the transition is age, that the patient is aging out of pediatric care, whether it's aging out of insurance coverage, whether you're getting too old to be admitted to the children's hospital anymore. Um, there is some age factor that precipitates this, and it is seen as a crisis that induced parental turmoil, but then that turmoil stimulates parental advocacy, where the, the parent really becomes the information gatherer and quarterback for the uh, transition process, gathering information uh, from support groups, from agencies, from healthcare providers, oftentimes information that's fraught with absent, incorrect, or conflicting information, and so parents get sort of held in a sort of captive waiting zone on that bottom left where they are waiting for information or experience or support but fear loss of pediatric services while waiting to get into the uh, adult care. Those uncertainties spur more turmoil, which in turn engenders more advocacy and information gathering and, and round and round. So ideally, it would be nice if we could knock out some of these circles and proceed along the green lines where at some point, uh, as a youth is aging out of pediatric care, we can empower the youth and their parents to become advocates, get information that is accurate information, and proceed more smoothly and more directly to uh, the adult care arena. Parents uh, in this work by Nurse Schultz um, identified three broad sources of information, healthcare providers, insurance and funding agencies, and support groups. And a couple of quotes, uh, physicians were helpful in the transition process from a physician standpoint, not from a red tape standpoint. Uh, I confess that I don't know a lot of the uh, ins and outs of insurances and certainly uh, adult uh, SSI determination and the like. Uh, social workers are, are typically more helpful in providing information about community resources and some of those red tape issues than physicians are. Uh, insurance and funding agencies may provide uh, case coordinators to assist in this process, but support groups were the most helpful sources of information for families overall. That's one uh, parents said, this is where you get all of your information. You get more information from parent groups than, than any other place. So going back to that consensus from the four health organizations, the consensus was that to ensure that by the year 2010, uh, eight years after the statement came out, and then of course eight years ago, all physicians who provide primary or subspecialty care to young people with special health care needs will understand the rationale for transition from child-oriented to adult-oriented health care. And I, I think we recognize that fairly well. Have the knowledge and skills to facilitate the process, which I would grade us with a C minus maybe. 
And three, no if, how, and when transfer of care is indicated. And I, yeah, I'll be generous and give us another C on that one. So how are we really doing? Well, um, in 2014, the Child Neurology Foundation convened a, a diverse multidisciplinary group and developed sort of a specific approach to the transition of pediatric patients to adult services based on current evidence where it was available and expert opinion where the evidence was lacking. It was a multidisciplinary task force that was composed of adult and child neurologists, pediatricians, nurses, allied health providers, patients, parents, and advocacy group members. And they came up with this transition diagram that identified six steps or ingredients to the transition and a suggested timeline with uh, ages for when some of these steps should be uh, initiated and, and completed. And so you can see right there in the middle that ages starting at age 14, we should start developing a transition plan for our patients. Well, this is that same uh, survey that the American Academy of Pediatrics did in 2008, looking at healthcare transition. And um, they asked pediatricians when they thought transition planning should begin. And I guess the good news is that the pediatricians didn't think adolescents with special health care needs should be transitioned later than uh, adolescents without special needs, but that most pediatricians didn't think you had to start, you should start talking about health care transition until age 18, as compared to the 14 age that the uh, neurology, uh, Child Neurology Foundation, and in fact, the consensus statement stated that we should begin talking about healthcare transition for our patients. When the uh, Academy of Pediatrics survey then asked pediatricians what did they do for healthcare transition, most made referrals to specific adult providers or subspecialists, but boy, look, 20% didn't even refer you to somebody. So they just said, okay, I can't see you anymore. Good luck. Uh, hopefully it wasn't quite as abrupt as that. Uh, it may have been a little vaguer in terms of saying something like, well, this is a group or this is a group and you should, you should decide. Uh, less, even, even less, even fewer physicians or pediatricians talked about what happens when you turn 18 in terms of discussion of consent and confidentiality issues, uh, issues of uh, guardianship if need be, uh, assistance with medical documentation for SSI, problems with, or assistance in identifying insurance options, and even fewer still really came up with individualized healthcare transition plans or provided education packets for families. So, you know, again, maybe a C minus is generous for uh, how we were doing. Now, this, this is, survey was from 10 years ago, and I think we do a little bit better job now, but I'm sure uh, several of you that are listening to this webinar have many stories to tell me. So about uh, eight years ago, we did a study, Dr. Bruder and I here from the USED, where we surveyed uh, both pediatricians and internal medicine uh, primary care providers here in the state of Connecticut. And one of the questions that we asked was, do you have a standardized transition process? And at the time, fewer than 20% of either uh, pediatricians or internists in, in general practice had a standardized transition process. And then when we asked the uh, providers who said yes, what kind of uh, process do you have? The pediatricians in the lighter blue bars and the internists in the darker blue bars, most of them had some written policy that they could give families. They were terrible at evaluating the process. Few of them had transition 
coordinators, we were poor at look, assessing patient self-mastery skills and no one did alternating visits, uh, which is the ideal way to transition somebody where I say, I'd like you to go see Dr. Jones in August and then come back and see me again in October to make sure that everything is going well. And if you like Dr. Jones, I'll, I will discharge you to, to her service then. Then we ask, where did you learn about healthcare transition, patient transition? And no surprise, most uh, internists and pediatricians hadn't had any training in healthcare transition per se. Uh, a few had got some information in medical school or residency, uh, more often in post-residency training or in independent uh, readings and, and studies. So if we're failing you, what can you do? And that's really what I want to focus the rest of this uh, webinar on are the things that you can do for yourselves and your youth. And uh, family responsibility center on three main areas, keeping a medical record, preparing youth to provide as much of their care as possible, and knowing and meeting time deadlines for legal and insurance matters. So the first one, keeping a medical record, I just Googled or I, I Bing the other day, keeping a medical history and I got 272 million results. So you just need to read all of these and make sure that uh, you know what they have to say. No, it, no really, uh, it's, it's straightforward. There, you can do really high, there's high tech stuff out there available for keeping medical records, but there's very low tech stuff too that are, that are simple and easy to do. And the more information that you have that you can bring with you, the better. So your medical journey or your medical journal should include your current physicians, uh, including your subspecialists, current insurance information, current medications, including over-the-counter supplements, allergies, immunizations, results of physical and physicals and major appointments, results of specific tests like blood work and x-rays, and then some documentation about chronic diseases and medical conditions, when they were first diagnosed, uh, what tests or procedures, how things have changed over time, and then any diseases that run in your family. Records to at least summaries of hospitalizations and surgeries and any significant accidents. So that you, so that you can give me this information and I have, in a nutshell, a fairly good appreciation of where your youth has been and hopefully then a better appreciation of where they're going. It's not necessary to include minor illnesses uh, unless they are recurrent or, or chronic. The second thing you can do is to prepare your youth to provide as much of their health care as possible. And there are some guides to help you do this. This, uh, this is one of, I think, the better healthcare transition websites out there. Uh, there's millions of these too. But this is from the Florida Department of Health and is available at the University of Florida uh, website called Envisioning My Future. And in this pamphlet, they have this table of what you should be able to master at different ages, going from ages 12 to 14 that they call new responsibilities, to an intermediate age is 15 to 17, practicing independence, and then to age 18 plus, taking charge. So let's look at the transition checklist at each of these ages in, in turn in, in a little more detail. So at ages 12 to 14, 12 years old already, how old, what grade are you in it when you're 12? Like you're in sixth grade or something. Um, so already, hopefully your child can describe how his or her disability or health condition affects their daily life. Uh, they can name their medications and the amounts and times I take them using their proper names. You know, it doesn't help me to say that you take a purple pill and a blue inhaler because guess what? There's a lot of purple pills and blue inhalers. So it is much more helpful to know the name of your medications. And, you know, I have 
18, 19 year old asthma patients who can't, you just tell me they're on an asthma pump. And I say, well, you can't tell me that. You have to know the name of your pump. You, you, I, I'm, you're never gonna go to college, you're never gonna go and do anything by yourself if you can't give me the name of your medicine. Hopefully, by age 12, uh, patients are answering at least one question during a healthcare visit. Boy, I try to start this at about age three or four. Um, as soon as somebody will talk to me, I'll try to start asking them questions. I manage my regular medical tests at school. I've talked to my doctors or nurses about going to different doctors when I'm an adult by age 14. And I can call my primary care doctors or specialist office to make or change an appointment. I, emphasis there is can versus will. Uh, but uh, potentially, yes, they could do that. The next group, age 15 to 17, now starts answering many of the questions at a healthcare visit instead of one or two. Maybe start spending time uh, alone with doctors during healthcare visits. Uh, I tell my doctors I understand and agree with the medications and treatments they suggest. I regularly do my chores at home without any, any need for nagging or reminding from any of my parents. Uh, I can tell someone the difference between a primary care doctor and a subspecialist, and I know if my doctors will or will not take care of patients who are older than a certain age. I can, I can reorder my medications when they're low, and I keep a personal health notebook or journal, which I confess that I don't do, and I, I probably should. Uh, by age 18, I can tell someone the effects that getting older may have on my disability or health condition because you've talked to your doctor and your doctor said, as you're getting older, these are things we need to watch for. I can tell someone about medications that I should not take because they might interact with the medications I do take. Boy, that's a tough one for all of us. I'm alone with the doctors or choose who is with me during healthcare visits. I ask all of my older patients who come with their parents, do you want your parents to stay with you or would you like them to step out? And sometimes I actually really encourage just uh, in clinic on, uh, on Tuesday, I had a guy that wanted to talk to me about some maturation guy related issues. And so I asked his mom to step out. I said, you know what, I think you need to step out for this. And if there's any concerns, I will talk to you about them. Um, and, uh, I will answer all the questions during a healthcare visit, and I manage all of my regular medical tasks outside of the home, such as at school or at work. I've identified adult doctors and facilities that I will go to when I leave my current doctors and facilities. So by age 18, 19, I might say, I'm gonna take care of you until 20 or 21, but this is who I think we're gonna transition you to. Yukon, Hartford Hospital, Norwalk Hospital, someplace. Discuss with your providers when you should consider transferring care. Ask your primary care provider, as well as your specialists, about this. And, and are there people on staff that can assist you in care coordination? Talking to other families and young adults with similar needs and disabilities may help you find the uh, adult health care provider that's going to be best for you. And this is a tough one, scheduled interview visits with healthcare providers before transitioning care. You know, we interview everybody, but we don't interview doctors very much. And it's, I will tell you that in 30 years of practice, never had I, have I had a family call me and say, we just want to schedule an interview to see if we want to come and bring our child to you. Uh, I've had patients bring their child to me and not come back, and so it was maybe they didn't like me, but um, or maybe there are other reasons. But but that that is something that we as providers should should offer to you. And so we have this checklist, these transition skill checklists that uh, ideally you will master. But the problem with these sorts of things, and the problem that's out there in almost all of the literature, is that they assume that. Your youth is, are, the youth are going to be able to do these things. And what if you can't? Then what? And that's where a lot of the healthcare transition stuff grinds to a halt. And so what we really need more than just a checklist is a expanded checklist 
where you say, how well do I manage my own health care? Take any of these conditions. Um, I keep a health journal. I, I take my medicines on time. I do X, Y, and Z. And to say, I can do this. I will learn to do this in the next six months. I will learn the name of my pump. And the next time I come back to see Dr. Schramm, I'll tell him what it is. I can do this with supportive technology. Maybe I have uh, uh, something on my phone that beeps when I'm supposed to take my medicine, or I have something that reminds me to do something. Or someone will need to do this for me. And if that's the case, that someone needs to be identified. Whether that someone is still the parent in an ongoing relationship with a child living, youth living at home, whether it's a healthcare aide or visiting nurse or someone who will come out to, to help with that task so that the um, youth is able to do it. And so I'll squeeze in a fourth responsibility here of uh, preparing youth to self-provide as much of their care as possible, but also identifying what assistance may be needed to do specific tasks and recruiting that assistance, just like you would recruit assistance for transportation or assistance for doing your taxes or assistance for doing anything else, recruit that assistance for your youth so that um, they can be as independent as possible. And then lastly, knowing and meeting time deadlines for legal and insurance matters. And so related to that, at age 18, I can tell someone what new legal rights and responsibilities I gained when I turned 18 years of age. And boy, this was something I confess I knew nothing about 10 years ago when I started working with Mary Beth. Uh, so, issue number one, HIPAA. Everybody knows HIPAA, Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. When you turn 18, when your child turns 18, parents no longer have automatic access to their child's personal health information. A story a few years ago has happened to me. Um, I did a surgical procedure on a young man four days shy of his 18th birthday. And we collected some specimens and sent them off to the lab. And he did fine, he went home. Week later, his mom is calling me for the results. And I pick up the phone and I go, oh, you know, Mrs. Smith, I have the results, but I can't tell you what they are because I forgot to have Joey sign a release of information form when I saw you guys last week. So I can only tell him what they are. So uh, she wasn't real happy about that calls me back in about an hour, and Joey's on the phone, and Joey says, hi, I want you to tell my mom what the results are. <laughs> and that was all he had to say, and that was all I needed. But, uh, but we need, but there's a right to privacy of personal health information, and uh, that needs to be addressed before a child turns 18 to, to know what I can do with that information or what, uh, uh, what we should do with that information. For some young adults, it's fine. They can, they're 18, they're, they're in charge. Rarely is that the case. And most of the time, patients that still come to me sign a release of information statement that says that I can talk to their mother, their father, their Uncle Joe, um, whoever, about their healthcare information. And I can continue that same relationship that I had with the family as compared to before the, the uh, youth turned 18. Some youth though may need more help than that. And so there's a whole hierarchy of different levels of support and of care, starting from that release of medical records and information to the uh, an ordinary healthcare power of, return of a attorney, which we, to be honest, all should have, which is that if, if I become incapacitated for any reason, this person can speak for me until I am no longer incapacitated and then I can resume directing my own care. 
Well, beyond that, you can have a power of attorney with special provisions that restrict that right to revoke the uh, that attorney privilege when I no longer am incompetent or incapacitated. And then moving on from there, there's court-appointed conservatorship, which can be conservators of the estate, meaning financial um, affairs of that person, or a conservator of the person, which is both financial and uh, medical and other legal issues. And then a court appointed guardians, which are a little stricter than conservators, and finally court ordered commitment or protective placement even for, for some individuals. Guardianship, if needed, is a lengthy legal process. Many, you know, we, we want our youth to be as independent as they possibly can be, but we also want them to be safe and, and well cared for as well. And if that means that they are unable to provide their care, then we need to continue to provide it for them and apply for guardianship. But it can be a lengthy process. And so recommendations here in Connecticut anyway are that the petition should be filed at least six months before an adolescent turns 18 to maintain guardianship or to initiate conservatorship for that for that youth once um, they turn 18. And then also uh, at, at the uh, taking charge group at 18, I can tell someone how long I can be covered under my parents' health insurance plan and what I need to do to maintain coverage. So at least currently as it still exists, although depending on the vagaries of Washington, under the Affordable Care Act, uh, otherwise independent young adults can stay on their parents' health care coverage until the age of 26. However, many insurance plans have different pediatric and adult provisions in them. So they may pay for various services, particularly support services like nurses or therapists for a child but they no longer but they won't pay for it as an adult so even though you are still on a insurance plan once you turn some age 18 to 21 the benefits on that plan may change in Connecticut we're one of 40 states that has an adult disabled dependent child provision, which basically extends the ACA coverage to forever. So for so youths over 18 may continue on their family plan if they are dependent for life on the care being provided by their parents and are unable to achieve substantial gainful employment. To be eligible, the child has to be on the family plan prior to turning 18. You need to touch bases with the plan before the child turns 18 because this is not automatic even though it's the law. And there's an annual recertification hoop that needs to be jumped through that uh, documents the disability and dependency of the, of the youth and young adult to stay on the plan. But again, fortunately, uh, we are one of the states here in Connecticut that mandates this insurance uh, benefit. Well, there's also medical assistance and uh, Medicare. So this is a pamphlet that was um, produced by the Kaiser Foundation in California. It's a 62 page pamphlet entitled Navigating Medicare and Medicaid, a resource guide for people with disabilities, their families, and their advocates. And you know you're in trouble when the first paragraph says, Medicare and Medicaid are extremely complicated and confusing programs. So get help with this. 62 pages is probably not enough. I read it and I'm not sure that I can, I could navigate anybody through this. SSI, so, uh, 
So um, disability benefits differ in adults and in, in children. And Social Security income eligibility requirements differ as well. So under age 18 years, for example, there is a child and youth disability determination. And over 18 years, there's an adult disability determination. I'm pretty good at pediatric SSI forms. I'm terrible at adult SSI forms, which is one reason why maybe I shouldn't be filling those out. Under age 18, it's the income and resources of the child and family that are taken into consideration for SSI. Whereas over 18, it's just the income and resources of the adult applicant themselves, not the family that's, that's involved. So, uh, and as I state here, just because you're receiving youth SSI doesn't mean you'll automatically qualify for SSI as an adult. There needs to be another determination. There needs to be more documentation, et cetera. And so to prevent interruption of benefits, the Social Security office should be contacted at least three months before the 18th birthday to, um, to work through those uh, adult forms. Medicare is even worse. So uh, Medicare eligibility rules for persons under 65 uh, with disabilities first require individuals to receive social security disabilities for five months before becoming Medicare eligible. And then once you've received social security disability for five months, then you wait another 24 months for Medicare coverage to begin. Uh, at least that's what it was then, and I think it's still fairly similar now. So this is a really complex and uh, interrelated process. And every state has different Medicaid and Medicare eligibility rules, and so the best advice I can give you is find someone smarter than me to help you get through this when the time comes. And there are, there are several websites that might help you. This is Got Transition. Uh, this is from the Center for Healthcare Transition Improvement uh, from the Maternal Child Health Bureau and the National Alliance to Advance Adolescent Health. It has lots of information for healthcare providers, for youth and families, uh, for policymakers, several uh, different uh, Websites you can go to for, for information, webinars, and the like, really a, a tremendous resource. The Neurology Foundation also has, I think, some of the better specialty dependent uh, information on, on transition of care. And this is just at the Child Neurology Foundation under transitions. They have a whole series of pages on healthcare transition, and there's a whole bunch of things on what they call stay a step ahead, preparing for the future of your epilepsy care. And what's nice about this is it talks steps through transition, beginning here at age 12, and there's sub-information for both families caring for someone with epilepsy, as well as for the patients themselves with epilepsy. So you start at age 12 about conversations, about keeping track of medical information. You go on to learning skills, getting ready for changing to care, beginning at age 13, start creating a transition plan, discussing legal responsibility by age 14. Boy, they're really ahead of the ballgame, which is fantastic. And then working together because, you know, really healthcare is just one of many things that you've heard all about in this webinar series that are important for our youth in transition from a childhood to adulthood, updating transition plans, and then one to two years before it's time, really trying to identify the epilepsy care team that are, will be assuming adult care for um, the patient, and then confirming that transfer of care as the, uh, as the process is over. So again, I encourage you to go to this website to look for more information as well. And then lastly, there uh, is um, also, there are also services provided here. Um, uh, 
if you actually want to talk to someone as compared to going to websites, I encourage you to contact the Connecticut Medical Home Initiative, uh, children with children and youth with special health care needs uh, services. And so there are five centers here in Connecticut. Uh, the North Central Center is housed at Connecticut Children. Their other ones are housed in uh, St. Mary's Hospital, in one in Norwich, uh, New Haven, and, and Stamford. And every uh, town is assigned to one of these sites, and you can find what site, what's your site, by going to the uh, Connecticut DPH website and looking up uh, healthcare needs or the Connecticut Medical Home Initiative to be able to get a, a phone number to call and directly speak to someone to help you with the healthcare transition process. So our challenges, so, you know, the consensus statement came out 18 years ago, and our challenges today, um, almost two decades later, are how can we get healthcare providers to initiate transition, transition services sooner for youth with special healthcare needs and to conduct them in a more organized and comprehensive fashion? How can we educate and empower patients and families to direct their healthcare transition and how do we provide more coordinated services for adults with special health care needs? With the goal of, again, not falling off the cliff, but having a smooth transition from pediatric to adult health care. So I thank you very much for listening. I know that we had a, a lot of information that we covered today. And I will uh, ha be happy to uh, talk about any questions that arise. Thank you, Dr. Schramm. We certainly could have done that in a three-part session, that's for sure, with all that information. That was really good. And it made me think, too, is you don't realize, you mentioned the approach being so different even from uh, the pediatric doctor to an adult doctor, or in our case, uh, for our clients, a pediatric um, neurologist and then an adult neurologist, where the approach really is going to be different and preparing them even just for, for that alone, too. So that, I feel like that was interesting um, to kind of hear that explained. And then also with the, the responsibility list that you gave, I feel like that could be really helpful. Um, I don't know if if that's something that you could send uh, or is something that is available on a website or I don't who created that? Well, that, the list uh, for the at different age, at different ages and yeah. responsibilities. That list that's yeah. from the uh, that's at the University of Florida website. Um, let me okay. show you this here in a minute. If, if my slides can still be up. Can you see this? Yeah. This is Envisioning My Future is the name of a pamphlet from the, Depart the Florida Department of Health, and it's available at this website at the University of Florida. Envisioning My Future. Okay. Yes, that, that was good. And then certainly, you know, with children that, are, that have a disability, of course, as you kind of put that disclaimer in where, Exactly, that right there, I, I thought that was perfect because even though there might be certain things that they can't do, they're still striving to complete these tasks, right, by certain ages, and, and which is what they need to be encouraged to do. So really, um, you see how this is uh, a team effort, right, from doctor, child, and then also the family to encourage um, this transition. Right, exactly, and, you know, if you can't, do something there's no shame in that you know I can't work on my car anymore so I take it to a, uh, a, a mechanic and so if you need help with one of these tasks identify the the technology or the person to help with that so that you can uh, achieve as much independence as possible right which yeah that's that's the goal so that was wonderful. Uh, I'm not sure that we have other questions that have been typed in there. Um, 
I'll ask the group here and if any you guys have any questions. Uh, they're easy. Okay. We can give the audience one more minute to type anything in. I would really encourage you to speak to your doctors um, about this. If they don't bring it up, you should bring it up and at least ask them, when do we need to start thinking about it? What skills should I be focusing on when? And, um, and sort of maybe as a, as a team effort, we'll both get there together. Yeah, I just, I, I love the idea of, you know, really just empowering these kids too, because this is, this is going to help them in other areas of their lives too, you know, not just in their healthcare transition, but in life. So, well, that, that was excellent. Um, Dr. Schramm, so I really appreciate your time and all of this great information. This will be available on our website. Uh, epilepsyct.com, a recording will be available. And then Dr. Shram, I believe it will be also available on the USED website, is that correct? Yeah, I believe so. Um, we will either get it from you or we will, um, we will get it up, yes. Okay. All right, well, on behalf of everyone here at the Epilepsy Foundation of Connecticut, I want to thank everyone for joining us and taking the time to view this presentation. And doc thank you, Dr. Shram and your team for um, your, your time and expertise today. It was a pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you.